The Conversion of Saul of Tarsus, a blended account from the book of Acts chapters 9, 22, and 26. Text found between brackets represent variant manuscript readings from the 5th century or earlier. In the biblical text, words found in black are those of Luke, the author of the book, words in green, quotations of Saul himself, words in red, quotations from Jesus, and words in blue, quotations from Ananias. We have analyzed this text in 14 points, the first of which calls historical persona and religious identity. In chapter 22, verse 3, Paul explains, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. Cilicia is located near the Mediterranean coast in southern Asia Minor, across the sea from Judea and the city of Jerusalem. A few points. I am a Jew, was then and is to this day a common confession. This city, of course, is Jerusalem. Gamaliel I was grandson of Hillel, founder of a school to teach the Hebrew Bible and oral traditions to common Jews. He was a Pharisee, that is, theologically conservative, a member of the Jerusalem Sanhedrin, or Council. It was he who defended the apostles of Jesus, according to Acts chapter 5. The law of our fathers includes more than the Hebrew scriptures, including as well the oral law transmitted by rabbis. Point 2. Saul's religious zeal and persecution of Christians. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Damascus was the capital city of the Roman province of Syria, which included the traditional Israeli territories known as Samaria and Judea. The term threats and murders is a Greek hendiadis, that is, two words comprising a single concept, which could be translated murderous threats. The letters were some sort of extradition authority. Compare 1 Maccabees 1521, If any scoundrels have fled to you from their country, hand them over to the high priest Simon so that he may punish them. The way here is an early Jewish designation for the new sect of those who would come to be called the gathering or church, the disciples, the Christians, or the saints. Section 3, Saul's authority to pursue Christians at Damascus. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed towards Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At the time, there were several levels of authority. These included the imperial authority of Rome, provincial authority, in this case, Syria, a regional authority, such as that in Judea under Pontius Pilate. There was royal authority granted for local kings and religious authority delegated to Jewish councils. Provisional governors invested religious councils with authority 
over their own adherents. The brothers referenced here are Jewish leaders of synagogues in Damascus, Damascus being the provincial capital of Syria, which included Judea, commonly called Israel. Section 4. Jesus appears to Saul in a great light. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. Saul interjected, O king, to bring a special attention to what followed. Paul spoke these words while held prisoner at Caesarea. In this case, the way, the same words as the Christian way, of course refers to the road upon which they were traveling, not to the Christians. Section 5. Jesus speaks to Saul, commissioning him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? The repetition of the name Saul, Saul, is reminiscent of divine words addressed, for example, in Genesis 21.20, Abraham, Abraham, and in 1 Samuel 3.4, Samuel, Samuel, indicating a divine call to Saul. Lord, remember, is first of all a title of respect for superiors, and Saul will soon adopt the same term to refer to Jesus as Lord. And he said to me, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place amongst those who are sanctified by faith in me. The term servant and witness, again, is a hendiades, which we can translate a servant who bears witness. The promise to deliver him employs the Greek preposition ek, which suggests to deliver him out of his troubles, not to keep him from those troubles, which for Saul, later called Paul, would include arrest, beatings, prisons, mobs, shipwrecks, snake bites, and much more. It should be apparent that we have in this text certain qualifications to become a true apostle of Jesus Christ. These include to see the risen Messiah physically, not merely mentally. Secondly, one must be personally appointed by Jesus. This is not in an office that we confer on someone else or which he adopts for his own. And he had to receive visible, audible revelations from Christ. Again, not merely dreams, or intuition. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus suggests a profile for Christian conversion, which includes eyes opened, that is, coming to an understanding granted by God, to turn from deceit to truth, that is, a truth conversion, to turn from Satan to God, that is, a power conversion, to receive forgiveness of sins, that is, a personal conversion, and to receive a place, that is, promises in the coming kingdom, to be made holy, that is, to now belong to Jesus Christ, and, of course, to have faith in Jesus as one Savior and Lord. Section 6. 
Jesus orders Saul to enter Damascus and to await instructions. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Now those who were with me saw the light but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. There has been some discussion amongst translators and commentators on just what it was that Paul's companions heard. Part of the solution to this lies in Greek grammar. The verb to hear, akuo, can be followed by the genitive of its object, that is, the word in English would be of, which means to hear something with understanding, or followed by an object in the accusative case, a direct object, that is, to hear a sound, not necessarily understanding its meaning. Now, we might pose the query, when does the Lord refuse to reply to the query, What shall I do, Lord? Hmm. Section 7. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Quote, And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. Unquote. And for three days, He was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Contrast Paul's experience with that of 2 Corinthians 4, 6, which says, God is the one who has shown in our hearts. That is, you and I have had a spiritual or mental revelation from Jesus, whereas that of Saul was physical both visual and audible. You might pose this query. Does fasting ensure that one will receive a revelation from Jesus or a revelation of Jesus? Section 8. Jesus appears to Ananias, ordering him to go heal Saul. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. The Lord said to him, Ananias, and he said, Here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Just to remember, a disciple is one who learns teaching and who obeys instructions from a teacher. In this case, Ananias was a practicing Jew who was also a follower of Jesus. Thus, he would call Jesus Lord, for it was Jesus who is in destructing a disciple of his. Section 9. Ananias objects, then relents, and goes to find Saul. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of m- go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. Saints in the New Testament merely means Holy ones, that is, those belonging to Jesus. These holy ones are those who call on your name, that is, whether you call him Lord, Jesus, or Lord Jesus, in any language of your choice. The term Gentiles in this version 
is literally all kinds of people, which can include the Gentile nations. In verse 15, the term translated for, Greek haughty, points to a cause, whereas in verse 16, the term translated for is the Greek term gar, which points to a reason. To understand the difference between cause and reason in this context, we must realize that there is, at some level, a certain cultural logic that may escape us foreigners. The house, in this case, refers to a previously mentioned house, that is, the one where Saul, the one where Saul was staying. Point 10. Ananias prays for Saul to regain his sight. Ananias came to me, and standing by me, said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. The term receive your sight in Greek anablepo can mean either to look upwards, when ana means up, or to see again, when ana means again. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, according to the book of Acts, the Jews were already baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yet, at each one's baptism, she or he would be filled with the Spirit. Point 11. Ananias confirms Saul's call and baptizes him. And Ananias said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. The phrase, God of our fathers, provides continuity with the first covenant that made with Moses, thus affirming that when a Jewish person becomes a Christian, he does not change his ethnicity. The righteous one, translated elsewhere as the just one, is equivalent to, quote, the just one of whom you have now become betrayers and murderers, in chapter 7, verse 52. To be baptized is an opportunity to call upon the Lord's name to be assured of forgiveness of sins, besides to be received into a local body of Christ. Saul would certainly be baptized according to normal Jewish practice, which normally meant complete immersion under water, with or without anyone else present. 12. Section 12. Jesus warns Saul to leave Jerusalem. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I am imprisoned and I beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. Now, this was Saul's second vision of Jesus. The phrase, I fell, literally means, it happened to me, that is, to become in ecstasy. Now, this is not to be slain in the spirit or in some way whacked out, but rather to become conscious of another reality, 
in this case, the real Lord Jesus Christ. We learn from this incident that to identify culturally with a community can get us in trouble even if we are filled with the Spirit. Now, we ought to identify as much as we can with communities whom we serve, but our message can still be rejected. Section 13. Jesus commissions Saul, apostle to Gentiles. Chapter 22, verse 21. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The promise here, I will send, is the verb apostello, from whence we get the term apostle in Greek, apostole, which is more than merely to be sent. It carries with it the authority of the sender. The term Gentiles here does not have a definite article and refers to non-Jews, not necessarily all of them. And verse and section 14, Saul has been obedient to his heavenly vision. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Remember, repentance mainly means to change both your beliefs and your behavior. Jews have to repent by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus, for they already know the true God. Gentiles, however, have to repent first by turning to the God of Israel, and then by calling on the name of the same Lord Jesus. Both Jews and Gentiles must learn to obey the commandments of the Lord Jesus in order to live as real disciples. May the Lord Jesus Christ himself bless you, teach you, affirm you, and fill you with joy in believing.